China's population lives in the big coastal cities of the east, like Beijing and Shanghai. But away from the heavily populated east, heading west to the outer provinces of Tibet, Xinjiang and Yunnan, the more diverse and mysterious this country becomes. Here, the harsh, unforgiving landscapes forge strong, resourceful people with unique lifestyles and heritage. Even in these remote regions, the winds of change are blowing hard. The future's arriving fast as China's secret lands are revealed. In the far reaches of China is the country's largest province, Xinjiang, a land of contrast and extremes. Scorching desert, bountiful harvest, frozen peaks, lush grasslands, a kaleidoscope of cultures, rich history and heritage, and the promise of a prosperous future as Xinjiang rises again. Xinjiang is massive about the same size as Iran, twice as big as Turkey, and borders eight Asian countries. Everything here is vast, from the Taklumakan Desert, the second largest shifting sand desert in the world, to the Bayun Bulak grasslands that seem to roll on forever. The climate in the Bayun Bulak is almost as dry as the neighboring desert but the grassland is fed by countless streams and rivers falling from the surrounding mountains. For centuries, this has been a home of Xinjiang's Mongol population, providing ample pasture for their livestock and the wide open spaces that underpin their nomadic lifestyle. Horses are central to Mongol culture and are treated with great affection and respect. In fact, it's been said a Mongol without a horse is only half a man. For young Naingtai, riding a horse is as natural as walking. And even at his tender age, he's a champion in the saddle. To city dwellers, camping out in a remote valley for months at a time may seem a harsh and difficult lifestyle, but the Mongols take it in their stride. Sandal 
The rhythm of this life is slow and steady and centered around family, horses and livestock in that order. To the Mongol, the horse is more than an animal. They're constant companions, symbols of freedom and well-being, essential for work and play. Horse racing is a favorite sport, and Nayingtai is about to test his skills at the annual celebration of Mongol culture. It's festival time on the Bayung Bulak. The big annual event on the Bayung Bulak grassland is the Nadam Festival, a 10-day celebration of Mongolian culture and sport that starts with great pomp and ceremony. Historically, the Nadam focuses on the so-called three manly skills. Horse racing, wrestling, and archery. Embracing skills that Mongolians have honed in battle over the centuries. These days, women can compete in archery and horse racing, but the wrestling remains men only. Mongolian wrestling dates back as early as the 13th century, when Genghis Khan ruled the steppes. A military sport for improving the strength and stamina of his troops. Today, it's the most popular sport for Mongolians. The rules are simple. Last man standing wins. Say, Before the horse racing properly gets underway, other events demand great riding skills too. Naying Tai warms up for his races by competing on the obstacle course, where riders try to get round all the strategically placed drums in the quickest time possible. Naying Tai isn't placed in this competition and decides to sit the next one out. It's the crowd favorite. 
Contestants gallop towards scarves on the ground, bending down to try to pick them up. Some riders make it look ridiculously easy. Others, not so much. Perhaps it's just as well Naying Tai gave it a miss. Horse racing at the Nadam involves several races over various distances. All a vigorous test of speed and endurance for horse and jockey. Even though Naying Tai has won several Nadam titles over the years, He's been training hard for his specialist event, a breakneck five kilometers. When he's racing, Naying Tai is only concerned with the very basics. steering his horse around the course and hanging on for dear life. Naying Tai is a rider of great skill and determination. As the race goes on, he opens up a big lead on the rest of the field. The result is never in doubt. Naying Tai adds another Nadam title to his impressive collection. And finally, gets to enjoy the festivities as a spectator. Desert dominates large parts of Xinjiang, like the Taklamakan, which literally translates to, you can get into, but will never get out. And yet, for centuries, this was one of the main highways of the fabled Silk Road, the ancient network of trading routes between the East and the West. But it wasn't just silk that passed along these routes. Almost any commodity thinkable began moving across Eurasia. By braving the wilds of Xinjiang, traders made their fortunes or died trying. In the East, the Silk Road started in Xi'an, the ancient capital of China, and went west over land through the heart of Asia onto Europe and ending in Venice and Genoa. In Xinjiang, the main northern route of the Silk Road wove in between so-called oasis towns like Hami and Turpan, and one of the most famous of all, Zhaohe. Zhaohe was built on an island where two rivers met. Walled by steep 30-meter cliffs, it was a natural fortress and home to a thriving city. And thanks to the arid desert climate, the earthen ruins are still remarkably well-preserved. Xu Dongliang, is an expert on ancient relics who knows Zhao He well. He's a master of restoring ancient silk artifacts recovered from ruined cities like this. Zhao He古城当时是兵家必争之地, 
可以控制住整个的天山的南北的交通的要呃要道。这个是中心大道，把整个交河古城从中间分成了两部分。现在这一部分呢，就是围墙里边呢是一个很空旷的一个场地。这个场地后来经过考古学者的考证，是认为当时是做贸易的地方。围墙最中心的位置是官署区。所以说，应该是当时的政府办公的地方。所以说，后来我们测绘之后发现，里头有寺院，就有将近五十多座。In fact, Jauhar was a major Buddhist center up until the 9th century. Along with the temples, there were monasteries and large stupas where Buddhist artifacts were kept. When the overland Silk Road was replaced by maritime trade routes, Jauhar started a slow decline. After a destructive Mongol invasion in the 13th century, the city was finally abandoned. But artifacts left behind, like ancient silk clothing preserved in the dry desert air, provide precious insights into times gone by. At the Institute of Turpan Studies, Mr. Shu reveals the processes involved in silk making, age-old techniques pioneered in China and held a closely guarded secret for over 2,000 years. First, the silkworm cocoons are boiled in water, so the gum holding the silk fibers together comes off easily. 经过电磁炉把水加热之后呢，我们里边放一点的那个茶砖，这样的话抽出的丝就是带一点点黄色，这样修补文书也好，修补丝绸也好，它就比较协调啊。Once the fibers have been unwound, they're spun into single strands. Typically, each cocoon produces between two and three kilometers of fine silk thread. Every chance he gets, Mr. Shu works on real pieces of Silk Road history. This is a fabrication and exhibition of the old silkworm cocoon. This is an old silkworm cocoon from the Shanxi Ruicheng Yongluo Gong. It is a temple. At the time, the temple used the silk thread and the silk thread. It was very strong. It was a temple of God's protection. From this perspective, it was finally put here. It was put here in the temple. The first job in restoring a silk antique is to figure out where it was made. Not that easy if only scraps remain and they're thousands of years old. But authenticity is crucial. Discovering where an antique was made and how will determine the methods used in its repair. This is a Arsena Chutou's fabrication. 当时我们拿到这件文物的时候，是在一个袋子里边装的是很糟朽、很碎的一些个残片。残片之后，经过一年多的不断的整平、清洗之后，发现了它是一个一个衣服，就是过去穿那个长衣，我们叫长衣。Restoring the ancient coat, like all the recovered treasures, takes meticulous technique and infinite patience. 它这个，现在我正在做的这一步就是用铺针的方法，引一根单丝，然后呢，把它用那个回针的方法给它进行一个针头的一个固定。固定之后拉一根长线过来，把收针的地方也做一个固定。每隔三毫米到两毫米，把它钉一下，这样的话它这个口子就不会再开。最重要的就是把失传的东西给它衔接起来，再把它继续传播下去，它就构成了整个这个文明的一个传承的一个链条，是这个链条一环扣一环，不要断裂。生命是通过文物来延续下去的。
In contrast to the ruins of Zhao He, another northern city has undergone spectacular growth, especially in recent years. Urumqi is the capital of Xinjiang and also has the distinction of being the furthest city from the sea in the world, about 2,400 kilometers from the nearest ocean. Despite that, it's officially designated a port, which allows it to offer lower tax rates to help attract business and investment. But there's a much bigger picture. Urumqi's dramatic development is largely driven by the Belt and Road Initiative. Launched in 2013, this is China's visionary plan to create a new Silk Road, transforming the old overland and maritime trade routes through massive investment in infrastructure. Under Belt and Road, Urumqi is fast becoming one of China's most important transport hubs. handling Chinese exports on the new and improved rail networks to Central Asia and Europe. Now,在我们新疆首府所在的乌鲁木齐站, 连接着西方和东方，包括我们经济文化交流的一个疏解点，物资运输这块来说都是比较重要的一个节点。One of the challenges of building the new railway locally was the natural wind tunnel formed by the mountains between Urumqi and the city of Turpan. The valley is blasted by gales for more than 200 days a year. Caravans of merchants on the old Silk Road were literally blown apart here, and the wind can still be deadly. Wulmuchi 有345公里上的是基座式的擋風牆,也為確保動車組的運行安全起到了不可磨滅的作用. But the fierce winds in the region also generate big business. This is Dabanchul, just south of Urumqi, the site of China's first large-scale wind farm and one of the biggest in Asia. An 80 kilometer long and 20 kilometer wide forest of turbines. Its success has inspired the building of large wind farms in other parts of China. And the dramatic growth in the country's wind generation capacity has blown away all previous predictions. There are about 23 million people in Xinjiang, and just under half of them belong to the Uyghur ethnic group. Uyghurs are predominantly Muslim. They started converting in the 10th century when Islam, like so many other things, arrived from the west down the Silk Road. The Uyghurs have a rich culture, including a distinctive musical genre known as mukam, a word from Arabic roots meaning place or location. In a village near the northern city of Turpan, this small school band is tuning up for a day's study. And there's a lot to learn. Mukam combines poetry, dance, classical music and folk songs largely played on traditional instruments. These children are studying Mukam during their normal school holidays. Attendance is voluntary and tuition is free. The headmaster says 
It's the responsibility of the older generations to keep the Mukam heritage alive. The headmaster's grandson, an accomplished Mukar musician himself, is home on holiday from university in Beijing to also teach at the school. This style of mukam has 12 separate pieces, all with different rhythms, melodies, and tempos. Playing just one piece can take two hours. Playing all 12 would literally take all day. It's a lifetime's work to master the mukam. That's why starting early is so important. Altın <gülüyor> Ma perde bir udar, iki udar oldu ma. Üçüncüsün ahang, tötüncüsü tek işte bir udar. Töt udar ola bir nakşık. It's a lot of work for these youngsters, especially when they could be enjoying a break from normal school. Mana muşu nakşık da töt udar ola hem de. Partiye gel, min rahmet digenli beşini tepedim. Başlansın. But there's clearly something in this ancient musical form that strikes a chord in their young hearts. Maynak bukallık için biz kalkan yaş evlatlara muşunu biz hayat vaktimizde kaldır kuş özümüzde makam çıkıp yedik. Kız Rus her kıl muşu makam çaldıran müzik ya lan ügüttüş. Şuna özlem kızıkıdıran bağlılığım için. It's said that the music and dance of Mukam are essential to the Uyghur as eating and drinking. Certainly these talented youngsters have built up quite an appetite and a celebration meal is well deserved.
Ben Muştab'da 65 yaş girdim. Ben Muş'u sahneye çıksam ya 25 ya 36 yaş. Aynı halde çıkalım hemen. Kağallama mangukşaş uzun ömür kürür. O zorunla bizdeki cemiyetimiz Muş'un mukam, miras. Ağırdığınızdan balıra. The city of Turpan and the surrounding area has the distinction of being one of the hottest places on Earth. In fact, it's known as China's Fireland. In the long, arid summer, temperatures regularly hit well over 40 degrees Celsius. And the searing surface of the sand can be twice as hot. just perfect for the ancient Uyghur medical practice of sand therapy. Something people from all over China visit to experience. Akbar has been coming here every year for the last 12 years. He normally stays 10 days at a time and credits the sand therapy for easing pains in his back, arms, and knees. Even though Akbar is a sand therapy veteran, he's checked every day to make sure he's not overdoing it. Too much puts him at risk of dehydration and heat stroke. And people with high blood pressure, heart disease, and diabetes have to get medical clearance to take the treatment. <laughs> Uyghurtibabetchilige <gülüyor> Akbar is quite at home in the burning sand. Incredibly, he barely raises a sweat. Just gone mad, so you do the red new, tanned new thing. Go on, ten minutes, twenty minutes, you go. Your body, the wind and the sun, the sun and the wind, are basically mixed together. But Turpan is not all scorching desert. In fact, large parts have been transformed into lush and bountiful farmland, producing a wide range of top quality fruit in the long, hot, bone dry summers. And the undoubted star is the humble grape, grown here for over 2,000 years. Here in Grape Valley, more than one dozen different varieties are cultivated, 
and the region's raisins are eaten all over the world. The Great Valley exists at all is thanks to an ancient irrigation system known as Cares. An engineering wonder consisting of hundreds of wells connected to more than 5,000 kilometers of underground channels. Using the natural fall of the land, the water reaches the crops where it's needed. Much of Grape Valley is still made up of small family holdings. Young families like Ardil and Jamila Emin and their children, 10-year-old Sophia and Muhammad, who's seven. Hey, Valdrem, Üzüm Perzentlerimiz ma, muşu bizimki terbiyeyimiz astıda çoğu adı do, en bulama. He, madem üzmez. Söyle ki sen onuza ha. Aka. Ya. Aka. Güzel, asla, asla, asla. Peyzim ki bulam. He. Tasıp peyz bir şey, değil mi? Hoş geldin ha. These huge bunches are the region's famous variety, the Manaitsa. Even though they're highly sought after fresh as table grapes, it's when they're dried using traditional turpan methods that they're taken to another level. These mud brick buildings, known as chuncha, are built on exposed ridges and are full of holes so the drying desert winds can blow straight through. Kendin tergibi kurup boğan neyken kuruk uzumda 84% yedildi. Sek tatlık, şunda tatlık oldu. Başında kalaylı gibi. Grapes are surely one of the treasures of Turpan. But not only for the produce itself. Grape Valley is becoming a favorite tourist destination. The combination of high quality fruit, the romance of vines cascading over trellis and the old world charm of the local people combine to make a heady brew. Grapes are not the only crop to be successfully grown here. 520,000 hectares of cotton stretch over the horizon. This is where over 70% of China's cotton is grown. The industry dominates the economy of several parts of Xinjiang, notably the capital Urumqi and the nearby city of Shihurtse. Mrs. Yang has been working in the cotton industry for 30 years. This is one of her own cotton fields and the harvest is well underway, dawn till dusk. Although her fields are now harvested by machine, some plants around the edges are missed and need to be hand-picked. One of the main changes is the move away from watering the cotton plants by hand a time-consuming and wasteful practice, with so much precious water lost through evaporation. The modern solution is to bury tubing to deliver the water down at the roots, drip by drip.
The other big change has been the shift to mechanical harvesting. It said one machine can do the work of 2,000 workers each day. And it certainly made Mrs. Young's life much easier. Although Mrs. Young now saves the effort, money, and time by using mechanical harvesters, her income is still dependent on how much cotton she can produce. It all comes down to the next few days, and she's feeling the pressure. Mr. Shu is very much in demand at harvest time. He owns and operates five harvesting machines, and right now, they're working night and day. I Although mechanical harvesting means no more work for seasonal cotton pickers, thousands of new jobs have been created at processing plants and textile factories set up locally to cash in on the cotton producing boom. And with the Belt and Road Initiative providing new high-speed rail links, these industries are in a great place to benefit from expanding trade. Even though some parts of Xinjiang are intensely cultivated, vast areas are wide open. Frontier land, China's very own Wild West. And, appropriately enough, there's even a wild horse here. Not a domestic horse that escaped and went feral, but a truly wild horse. The only species in the world. This is Shavalsky's horse, named after the Russian explorer Nikolai Shavalsky who described it while on his travels in 1881. Nomadic people of Xinjiang and Mongolia had hunted the horse for centuries for its meat and skin. But in the 20th century, overhunting, loss of habitat, and a series of very severe winters saw Shavalsky's horse declared extinct in the wild. The only surviving members of the species were in European zoos. And by the end of the 1950s, there were just 12 left. And only nine capable of breeding. An international effort was launched to save the horse, with captive breeding programs in several zoos worldwide. And here in Xinjiang.
在这儿工作是已经十七年、十八年了。然后这个我当时来的时候，这个野马数量是九九十八匹嘛，现在四百多匹嘛。野外的马的这个体型啊，这个马是总是直直的，这个说明是出血，出血了啊，没咋叫。如果它的那个这个动物太长了，倒下来的话，就那个马血血里面还含有点不太出。啊。The vet and his students have to make sure any injuries or diseases are treated fast and effectively. In such a vulnerable population, any fatality is a massive blow. 过来，这边。看看这个野马的停停止的时候，必须要一个手在这儿，那后面不要去了，因为你把这个地方它不会咬你的，就转过来，转过来的时候你这样转，你再往这边转的话，它是过来挤你的啊，以后注意，然后把这个手放在这儿，然后这个停止在这儿，心脏部位啊，现在这个呃十六里八十十四十啊。十二个是这个地方都是肺部的位置，现在它那个肺里面可能有一个肺炎的感觉。换一个驱虫药给一下，快驱虫药啊！嗯，还以为其实说这，哎，吃吃药就会它的效果。None of Shivalsky's horses bred here have been returned fully to the wild. The closest is a herd moved to a wildlife reserve. Even there, they are closely monitored and given extra feed over the long winter. If the weather is too severe, they're rounded up and returned to the center. It's hoped that one day, the wild horse will once again run completely free. The survival of the Shavalsky's horse is hailed as one of the great comebacks in conservation history. It was truly an international effort, and there are now an estimated 2,000 horses worldwide, and 350 here in one of their original homes. The people of Xinjiang may come from different ethnic groups and cultures. They may have different beliefs and interests. But they also have a lot in common. To survive and make a life here, in such an extreme environment, they have to be determined and resilient. With a physical and mental toughness that sets them apart. Their attitudes reflect the landscape, dynamic and strong, big and bold. Xinjiang is a place where the past is respected and the future is embraced, where the Silk Road, the world's greatest trading route, is being revived in spectacular fashion. This frontier land so long remote, is fast becoming, once again, a region of influence and opportunity.